while we're waiting for the the um, projector, let me just uh, let you know that we're talking about the three angel messages. And uh, the last few months, we've done the first angel's message, which is uh, Revelation 14, 6, and 7. And we discovered uh, last time, we discovered that the, um, the reason that we worship God is because, among many other things, his great work of creating us and redeeming us by his everlasting love. And we also discovered that the pre-incarnate Christ, that is, the word of God himself, he was the agency through which God lovingly created our world in six literal days. And mankind was the crowning act of creation. We also learned that after God created his, um, this world in six literal consecutive days, he rested on the seventh day. And he blessed the seventh day. And he made it holy. And therefore, the Sabbath day became to be. And it became known as the Sabbath of the Lord. And we also learned that the Sabbath is God's seal. And we worship God by keeping his Sabbath holy. And by doing so, we acknowledge him as our creator and also as our redeemer. Any questions so far? Now, the Hebrew word for Sabbath, who knows the Hebrew word? Who remembers the Hebrew word for Sabbath? Shabbat. Shabbat. That's right, Roger. And we can say Shabbat Shalom. It means Sabbath peace to you. It's a Sabbath greeting. that, um, And it, it puts together Sabbath and peace in and the Sabbath, or Shabbat, is God's temple in time. And it points to what? It points to? It points to Jesus. That's right. The Sabbath points to Jesus. It is also pointing to the plan of redemption through Jesus. And by God's grace, we keep our body temples healthy. Because the Sabbath, um, you will see, is a sanctuary in time. And we are God's sanctuary in space. So we are each um, in our frontal lobes which is one-third of our brains, we have the Holy Spirit as we invite the Holy Spirit in. So we have here, we are full, everyone here, as we invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts, our sanctuaries. And we are gathering together as a sanctuary, uh, as Sanctuaries, each with the Holy Spirit, in a temporal sanctuary in time, you see. And um, you can see this in the actual uh, spelling of the Hebrew for Shabbat, which is spelled Shin Beit Tau. And um, we won't go through all of this, because we've uh, 
I've covered this before. The ancient symbol for Shin uh, depicts destruction by fire. And that's what occurs at the altar of sacrifice. So Shin represents the aspect of justification on the altar of sacrifice by the sin pardoning power of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And we symbolically participate in this through baptism, where we experience death to self, burial of the old person, and resurrection as a new spiritual being. And this is something that occurs that we need for real. It's a symbol of something that's real. Bait represents tent in the Hebrew um, economy. And of course, in the tent, we have that daily discipline of Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. And this is the, these are the disciplines by which God daily grows us into the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, Tao, which represents the covenant. And it's actually shaped like a cross in Hebrew. Um, ancient Hebrew, that is. Modern Hebrew, it looks different. But the, it represents the covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, this is where God places his seal by the Holy Spirit through the latter rain power where we have the experience of the new covenant where God's law is written in our hearts. All right, so I guess the only people who can see the slides are our YouTube audience. So you might have to go look at YouTube to see the slides. But let's turn right now to Revelation 14, 8. And here we see the second angel's message. So we're getting into the second angel's message today. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So three questions naturally arise when we read this passage. First, who is Babylon? Second, what is her wine? And then third, what is her fornication? Today, we will attempt to address the first question. Who is Babylon? Next time, we'll talk about the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All right, so who is Babylon? Let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah 31. It's a good thing we have our Bibles because then we don't need the slides. So take out your book or your phones or your devices where you have your Bible and turn to Jeremiah 31. And let's look at verses 31 and 32. Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. So you see here that God contracted a marriage with his people. That relationship between Christ and the church is why we need um, to understand the biblical understanding of marriage. 
between Christ, who is the man, and his church, who is the wife. And his people, were they faithful to God? Unfortunately, they were not. And the sad story is written in the book of Ezekiel. So let's turn to Ezekiel, which is after Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 15. Ezekiel 16, 15. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and playedst the harlot because of thy renown and pouredst out thy fornication on every one that passed by his it was. Wow, what a gruesome picture of unfaithfulness. I wish you could see the slide. You can see it on YouTube later. Because this, his people apostatized. They broke his covenant and profaned the Sabbath and defiled the sanctuary. Not only that, they killed her children. So the church killed her own children. So we can read about this specifically in Ezekiel. Just turn to chapter 23, verses 38 and 39. Ezekiel 23, 38 and 39. Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For after they had slain their children for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it. And indeed, thus they have done in the midst of my house. So do you see where this is occurring? It's not the world that's doing it. It's happening in the midst of God's house. So it's very clear that it is the church herself that has defiled the sanctuary. And remember what the sanctuary symbolized? It symbolizes justification, sanctification, and glorification, which is receiving the new covenant by faith through the laddering power of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, she kills God's children. The New Testament again talks about this, how Jesus married his church. And we all know about uh, Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, we see very closely how much God loves his church. He loves his church so very much that he does not want her to be anyone else's. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul here is saying that this is godly jealousy. See, the man, man's jealousy is not good. It's wrong, right? A godly jealousy, that is a proper jealousy. It's talking about how it's talk, it called godly jealousy is so that it's for the good of the church. Okay, it's so that she 
may be a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, a pure church, a church that brings forth the fruit of their virgin. That is, she reproduces in each of us the character of Jesus Christ. However, what did the church do? The harlot church apostatizes. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read about this. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's before Timothy, First and 2 Timothy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. We read, let no one deceive you. What? By any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away. And that Greek word there is apostasia, or apostasy. So there will first be an apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself, Dr. Lowe, that he is God. Do you see that? This man of sin is how the church apostatizes. Sitting where only God belongs, between the cherubim, showing himself. In other words, in his mind, he thinks that he is God, and he's trying to convince the whole world that he is God. You see, that's the harlot church. That's the church that apostatizes. And what is the name of this harlot church? Let's turn to Revelation 17, verse 5. In Revelation 17, verse 5, God identifies this church so that there is no mistake. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So not only is she a harlot herself, her daughters are harlots. And she is also of the abominations of the earth. So you think of all the bad things that go on in the earth. Who's the mother of this? Babylon. Wars? Babylon. Famines? Babylon. Pestilence? Babylon. Do you see how Babylon is involved in every abomination upon the face of the earth? All the abominations that go on in this culture and society is because of this harlot church mystery, Babylon the Great. If you go back to the first verse of Revelation 17, we see that she sits on many waters. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And so you see, she's clothed in red and scarlet and purple, but there's not a bit of blue in her. Okay, it's all her, she's, she's trying to, you know, tell about her, her royalty, but nothing about her loyalty to God. And 
in Revelation 17, 15, we see what those waters mean. Revelation 17, 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So you see, Babylon's control is worldwide in scope. Okay? She fornicates with the kings of the earth. In other words, she doesn't go by the constitutional principle of separation of church and state. She's involved with the political powers of the world. All right? In Revelation 17, 2, it says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You see, so the whole world is controlled by Babylon. Okay, again, I emphasize to you, we're not attacking any people here. There are many people in this system who truly love God and who I believe will be saved. But it is the system is what the word of God is writing against. She is the mother. That means she has daughters, which also must be Babylon because they are children of her mother. And remember, on her forehead was written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So these are her daughters. And in, we read this already, Babylon gives wine to all nations. All the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And we see that she is rich. And her colors are what? Purple and scarlet. So do you know a church whose colors are purple and scarlet, but no blue, okay? There's no true blue in her. It's all decking herself, pointing out her own beauty and her royalty, but there's no loyalty. In Revelation 17, 3 and 4, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. We see that Babylon also has a history of slaying in the um, most cruel ways the true people of God. In Revelation 17, 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. We also see that Babylon is a threefold counterfeit of the triune God. You see, everything that God has instituted, Babylon has a counterfeit. So we have the Holy Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, Babylon has what? Well, we'll read about this in Revelation 16, 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, 
You see, there are three parts of Babylon. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in. Remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So you see, there are three parts. And let's see in Revelation 16, 13, and 14, who are these three parts? And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we see the three parts of this system involve the dragon. And we know from Scripture, the head of this power is Satan, that old serpent, okay, that dragon. The beast and the false prophet. This threefold union should bring to your mind the threefold enemy of Elijah and John the Baptist. Remember? The, who were the threefold enemies of John the Baptist? It was not only King Herod, but more so his harlot wife, Herodias, and the daughter, Salome, you see? This threefold union of harlot, daughter, and the king. Also, for Elijah, we had Ahab, Jezebel, and her false prophets. Okay, So we see the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, symbolized by this threefold union. And in Revelation 16, 7, I'm sorry, 17, 16, we see, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So we see the end of Babylon will be accomplished through the kings through which she committed fornication with. And it's interesting because what happened? How did Israel fall? It was by the same powers that she sought to. Instead of seeking to God for help, she sought Assyria, you know, and so Assyria came and conquered Israel in 722 B.C. How did Jerusalem fall? How did Judah fall? Well, she showed Babylon. Remember when Hezekiah was healed and, you know, the, the sun or the sundial went backwards you know, by uh, 10 degrees. And the Babylonians, who were great astrologers, they sent envoys to Hezekiah. What's going on? She proudly displayed her gold and silver. So a lot of purple and scarlet, but no blue, you see. So... I just want to say again, we're not, you know, God's not attacking people. There are people in every church that love God and who will be saved because we are judged on what we know. And we have Babylonians in every church. I'm not saying the church is Babylon, 
but every church has Babylonians in it who follow Babylon, who don't have any blue, no true blue, no obedience. Okay. Let's look at Revelation 18, 1 through 5. Oh, so the main point of that prior slide is that the kings with whom Babylon commits fornication will be the one to destroy her. Just as it happened in the history of Israel and Judah in um, 722 B.C. for Israel and 605 through 586 B.C. for Judah. All right, let's look at Revelation 18, 1 through 5. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Where is God's people? Yeah, there's Babylon. They may not be in actual Babylon, but there might be Babylon in their hearts. He wants us to separate from any trace of allegiance to Babylon, that system against God and his law, that we might not be partakers of her sins and that we receive not of her plagues because the seven last plagues are coming, folks. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. So you see, God has a remnant. He has a faithful remnant. His true church remains faithful while the harlot was fornicating with the kings of the earth and causing the whole world to drink of the wine of her fornication. The true church is clothed with the garment of Christ's righteousness which shines like the sun and stands firmly on the moon on the word of God and on her crown, on her head, a crown of 12 stars. So today we learned that God married his church in a figurative, spiritual way, but nonetheless, marriage, non, uh, marriage just as strong a covenant as marriages today. And look how Satan is attacking marriage. He wanted her to be his alone and to keep his laws and to remain pure. However, early in her history, Israel apostatized and became a harlot by embracing the teachings and practices of the surrounding nations. She adopted the abomination of these nations, decked herself with gold and silver to impress the foreign kings and committed fornication with them. She defiled God's sanctuary, trampled on his holy Sabbath, and persecuted God's true followers. And her daughters did as she did. Her hands were full of bloodshed. God said that she would drink the dregs of the cup of his wrath and destruction would fall upon her from the four corners of the earth. And what was her worst abomination? It was sun worship. Worshipping the sun. Because that's what all the nations around her were doing. You see. 
All those pagan deities have sun, the sun as a prominent figure in their worship. And finally, the nations that she fornicated with rose up against her and destroyed her. And sadly, the Christian church has repeated the story of ancient Israel. And yet, Jesus said that this would happen, right? There would be wheat and tares. God has a remnant. And the job of the remnant is to give these messages, the three angels' messages, to give the true gospel. You see how she defiled the sanctuary and turned topsy-turvy the way people are saved? That's what happens. You know, people have a very false idea of how salvation works. And so we need to uphold the everlasting gospel and to say to the world that is seeped in thoughts of evolution and believing and trusting science over the God who created physical life on this earth. He is the one who created the laws of physics and chemistry and biology, anatomy and physiology. And people would rather believe that we are descended from unicellular organisms. Which, by the way, you know, taking billions of years is not enough time because the rate of mutation, useful mutations, it's very, very low. It would take literally forever because it never happened. So that it's our job to give this message. Worship the creator and redeemer by keeping his day holy. Who made Sunday the day of worship? It wasn't the Lord. It was a man. Okay. And so I have a, I have a call. Do you desire to come out of Babylon? That is, you may be in the world, but not to be of the world. Do you desire to be faithful to God and lovingly keep his Sabbath day holy? Are you willing that God use you according to his purpose to call others out of Babylon? If you are, then stand with me as we join together in prayer to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for showing us very clearly who Babylon is. And we each may have been influenced by Babylon, and we may have Babylon in our hearts but you see by those who have stood that we would not have it so. We ask, according to your mercy and grace, to forgive us for the Babylon we cherish in our hearts. Lord, cleanse us of Babylon. Help us to let go of every vestige of Babylon, that we may fully come out of Babylon. We desire, Lord, to be faithful to you and to honor you by worshiping you on your holy day. No matter what the world may say, help us to be true to you. And we'll let you take care of all the rest. 
And Lord, finally, we would not be the only ones to be saved. We want you to use us in every and any way to save others. For hearing these prayers and the magnificent ways you will answer these prayers, we praise, extol, honor, and glorify you. For we do claim them in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.